Kagan, who's a theoretical particle physicist at the University of Rochester, uh, where he has been since he got his PhD uh, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He, as I've been telling you over and over again in the weeks leading up to this, uh, was one of the people that established some theoretical underpinnings for a particle that came, that's come to be known as the Higgs particle. Shorthand part of the T predicted its existence. Uh, and for this work, he received the very prestigious Sakurai Prize in 2010. And he's going to be talking a little bit about that work. Uh, I have to point out that perhaps his greatest claim to fame is that he is the grandfather of Elise Hagen, Latin class of 2027. So that's another important thing he has done. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Hagen. Photograph 
of 20% of the CMS collaboration. Well, there are in excess of a thousand professional physicists who do this, along with graduate students and support staff. And here we have a typical event which might be recorded in this uh, recent run in searching for the missing boson. And it's a very complicated thing to analyze. Back in the days of my youth, when we had actual photographs, these things were analyzed by young women with good eyes, who generally tended to be wives of graduate students, and so it's done by hand. In the current era, this is all done by online computing, without which the 500 trillion events recorded by the LHC could not possibly have been analyzed. Okay, so uh, a little bit of a digression here so you can keep track of the uh, energy terminology. I'm going to define a thing called an electron volt, and I can convert mass to energy by Einstein's famous E equals mc squared formula. And uh, so if I divide out the electron mass, electron charge, I can convert that to an electron volt. Well, you might ask, how large is an electron volt? And it's generally associated with atomic structure. If an atom decays from one state to another, it emits a photon, and there's a certain energy associated with that. And that energy is typically on the order of a few electron volts. If you go up by a factor of a thousand, you come to a K energy. Nothing terribly exciting happens there for our purposes. So we go on to an MEV, a million electron volts, and that's roughly twice the electron mass. Proceeding, we come to the GEV, 10 to the ninth, a billion electron volts. And that's roughly the proton mass, which makes the proton mass 2,000 times the electron mass. And finally, we come to the TEV, or 10 to the 12 electron volts, and that's comparable to the energies obtained by the LHC. Okay, on July 4, 2012, I was privileged to be there at the announcement at CERN concerning the discovery of this new particle. And as you can see, that at 5.30 a.m., the line started forming for the people who did not have reserved seats. And here is the interior of the CERN Auditorium. The fellow on the stage there, wearing a tie, is Joe Candela, who is the principal spokesman of the CMS collaboration. So he gave the first of the two seminars given that morning. Okay, here we have on the right, Joe and Candela again, that's Hoyer next to him. He's the Director General at CERN. Uh, the lady in red is Fabiola Giannato. She is the principal spokesperson of the Atlas Collaboration. She gave the second seminar on July 4th. Uh, you may be interested in the fact that recently she was the runner-up. She was one of half a dozen runners-up in Times Person of the Year Award. So, uh, and each of Joe and Candela and Fabiola got a million dollars from the Milner Award uh, quite recently. Okay, and the guy here to her right, and his name is Bertolucci, and I always have to make sure I don't say Bertolucci when I'm the first one. <laughs> okay, so here's the data. On the right, we have the CMS data. On the left, we have the Atlas. And you see that little bump there where the green arrow is, that's the particle. And you may look at that and say, I'm not terribly impressed. That's just a little bump. What does it mean? But scientists, physicists have a very demanding standard of what is actually discovered. There's a so-called five sigma test, which means that there's one chance, less than one chance in a million, that that is a random statistical fluctuation. So there was no doubt that there was something there particularly when you have two of them getting exactly the same answer. And the scale here shows that the discovery occurs at roughly 125 GeV, and I remind you that that's 125 times the proton resonance. So quite a bit. Ah, uh, okay, we'll cross over that. And the question is, is this particle, which we call H, a missing or elusive boson? Note the Z and the W, I'll be talking about those. The gamma there is the photon, and the G to its right is the gluon. About which we won't say too much today. 
Okay, so here are the theoretical contributors to the foundation of this particle. These, uh, this work was done uh, 50 years ago, roughly. Uh, let me just remark that uh, Engler and Braut, uh were doing their work in Brussels. Higgs was doing his in Edinburgh. And around which Kibble and I were working at the Imperial College in London. Okay, so uh, that's a wistful look way, way back, but you'd like to see what I looked like in my time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, here we are at the seminar, and uh, I mentioned six people. One of them, Brown, has since deceased, uh, and Kibble did not elect to join it. So here we have on the lower left, Ramek, and he's smiling because he just made a joke about this being more like a football rally than a particle physics seminar. And that remark was picked up by Sports Illustrated and uh, without attribution. And here, upper there, we have Engler and Higgs uh, and myself there in the lower right. Okay, here's the uh, official APS release about the uh, 2010 uh, Sakurai Prize. Rumbach and I have been together for quite a while. We met as sophomores at MIT many years ago, and he's now at Brown, as it shows there, and uh, we still have been quite the contact. Okay, here's our official portrait from the uh, presentation. You'll note that King Pinks has a slightly different background, and that's because he didn't show up, and so that was a later add on. Okay, uh, I got to go back and explain to you a theory called QED, quantum electrodynamics. And where did that come from? Okay, uh, basically traces back to the Second World War, of which you are dimly aware. And uh, back in those days, well, the scientific community rallied to the common cause, and they did a number of projects, most famous of which is the Manhattan Project, or the development of the atomic bomb. No less worthy, however, was the tremendous first four weekend microwave technology, which was crucial to the war against the Gubbles. And uh, it's made possible the measurement of very slight energy differences, which was then used after the war to measure such things as line shift. Line shift is a very small splitting between two of the states of hydrogen which was not even known prior to the development of this microwave te technology. And so theoretical physicists were faced with the chore of explaining this very tiny energy difference. And this is the birth of one of the dynamics. And in 1955, Lamb, Willis Lamb from Yale, received the Nobel Prize for his measurement of the lamb shift as the push for the electron magnetic moment measure. Ten years later, they got around to the theorists, Feynman, Schwinger, Tamanaga. Feynman's name will crop up again when we talk about this thing called Feynman diagram. Okay, and here we have it. Here's something called a Feynman diagram. And the, oh, there we go. Okay, this wavy line is used to represent a photon. The solid lines are used to represent electrons. This thing shows that a photon can come along and go into an electron and with the reverse arrow it's a positron and then recombine and go on its very way. This one here for the, the electron comes in and this is a photon, reabsorbs it, and goes along once again. What's the relevance of this? You have to calculate the contributions of all these various diagrams to what we call the energy of the electron, the self energy. Well, you look up here, it goes into a pair, but the momentum of this particle and this particle can be anything. So you have to sum over all possible momentum. momentum. As you do down here, this momentum could be anything, you sum over that. You sum over that infinity, you get an answer which is itself energy. So there's a problem. That's the conundrum faced by particle physicists of that day. So, what do you do about this? And the great breakthrough solution 
is renormalization. Seems like a cheat when I describe it to you, but it works extremely well. Okay, so we imagine we want to calculate a quantity x, and we do that by successive approximation. We get x0, x1, and so on and so forth, and then you add them up and you get the answer. That's the intuitive way to do it. And what's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it is the sum does not exist. It's infinite. So if you get an answer which is infinite, that's not a calculation. That doesn't enable you to <coughs> say you uh, predicted something. So you've got to do something clever. And that's renormalization. And that seems almost rapid, as in this picture here. And uh, there's a <laughs> exhortation here that you should be more explicit. Well, time forbids that I be more explicit. I'm just going to have to tell you the results, and uh, you will be happy about that, I think. How does it work? So I talked about adding up all these x's, and I say that we split it into a y and a z. Okay, so I did it. And what happens? If the sum over the y is infinite, is, is finite, and the sum over the z is infinite, well, we've got a separation. Does that do us any good? Well, it does, because of the fact that the divergent sum can be lumped into the electron mass and the electron charge. And so we say, OK, that thing is a bunch of infinities, but they add up to something finite. That's the normalization. And it's very tricky, but it works because the photon has zero mass. OK, post QED. QED worked extremely well to an extraordinary degree of accuracy, but we were not going to rest on our laurels there. We wanted to do other things. And here we have a listing of all the possible types of interactions, like your magnetic weak, strong gravity. Gravity is very difficult. It still has not been solved today. But uh, we wanted to unify these others, the electromagnetic, the weak, and the strong. And really, the hard part is unifying electromagnetic and weak. Well, again, what is the weak interaction less familiar than the electromagnetic? But here's a famous example of it. Neutron decay. A neutron can go to a proton plus an electron plus an a plus a neutron. Okay, if I have a neutron in my hand here and I watch it, 11 minutes later it's not going to be there because it has beta decay. Fortunately, in the atoms which make up our body, the neutrons are bound in such a way that they cannot really decay except in the super heavy elements, the transuranic elements. Okay, so anyway, we're going to try to indicate here in a very general way how spontaneous broken symmetry, the thing which uh, the Sakura product was awarded for and allowed us to have this tremendous breakthrough, how it can be incorporated into weak interaction to be as well understood as QED. Okay, so weak interaction. There is the weak interaction diagram, a neutron going to a proton plus a neutrino plus an electron. And okay, I could twist this thing over here and make it a, a positron so in order to be topologically equivalent to this electron electron scattering diagram. So just imagine that thing over here bent like so, and that's not really a problem as far as physicists are concerned. So anyway, the diagrams look similar, so maybe we can construct a weak interaction theory by analogy to QED. Okay, so in, in weak interaction, a W is being exchanged between the two vertices, whereas in electric magnetism, a photon is being exchanged. Can QED then be the template for weak interaction theory, just changing photons to W's? Is that is all there is to it? Well, the problem is you do that and you say, where are all the W's? We don't have W's floating around in our everyday life. We have photons galore out every light from its photons. But where are the W's? You don't have them. You don't have zero mass W's. So, what do you do about that? Well, it turns out, thanks to spontaneous symmetry breaking, we can have our cake and eat it too. And we do that by 
hoping that two things can be simultaneously achieved. First of all, we start off with a zero mass W as a photon, and we are going to hope that by spontaneous symmetry breaking, we can get a mass W. And that avoids, of course, the embarrassing question of where are all the Ws? Secondly, we have to hope that this acquisition of mass doesn't interfere with the normalizability. You recall I said that the renormalization program depended crucially upon the fact that the photon has zero mass. Well, let's see how it goes. And to do this, I've got to quickly tell you a few basics about quantum mechanics. So, uh, as follows. Any particle has to have a, a spin s, which in certain units has to be 0, 1 half, 1, 3 half, etc. Secondly, if you measure along any given direction, they can only have the values from s, s minus 1, s minus down to minus s, and if you look at that carefully, it's 2 minus 1 point possibility. So, applying this, then, uh, there is also the exceptional case of zero mass, for which you can only get s or minus s along any given direction. So how does this work? Electrons, protons, and neutrons all have spin one half. So there are only two possibilities, spin up or spin down. And that fits with the two s plus one. However, protons can spin s equal to one, and thus they only have two, because they're massless, only have two possibilities, and these could be looked upon as left-handed or right-handed polarizations. Okay. The W, if we're to, to make an analogy to QED, must have spin one, like the photon. But if it's to acquire mass, it has to acquire a third possibility to fit in with the two left plus one. And that's what is achieved by spontaneous symmetry. Okay. Physicists always like to deal with the idea of a vacuum, the lowest state of the system. Nothing there, not a single photon, not an electron, nothing, empty space. Okay, now, in empty space, there could be such things as fields. You know, if you have a magnet a refrigerator and so forth, there's an attraction there, and there's nothing connecting the two, but nonetheless, something is filling the space there, and that's what we call a field. Now, if you measure, if you take a meter into that and try to measure the strength of that field, you must get zero. Because we've already seen that there's a magnetic force there which is, has a preferred direction, and empty space can't have a preferred direction. It's got to be the same in every direction. So a measurement of an electric or magnetic field in empty space must give zero. However, there's a way to get around this if you introduce something which is field, but some other field, called the H, which has not spin 1 like the photon, but rather spin 0. And that does not violate the rule. It has not have any spin, so it does not prefer a direction. And so consequently, we could have a meter to measure the H field in vacuum and could give a non-zero result. That non-zero result is spontaneous symmetry. Okay, so now we come to the issue, mass defined as W, and okay, you put into this H field, S equals zero. Technically, you have to do two of them, uh, and that's a complicated issue, but you can't get away with just one. And so you require that one of these two H fields has a non-vanishing expectation in the back. A glorious result. So here it comes. The two polarizations of the W acquire mass, as does one of the newly introduced scalar fields. And those masses are exactly the same, fortunately. And so these three together provide the required three polarization modes required for a spin one up. Okay? Leftover orphan is the godfather. So we took put two in there. We saw that one goes with the two components of W, leaving the one left over. And here's the toy illustrating that. We have the W with its two polarizations, S1 
absorbing the spin zero particle. Okay? Is it renormalized? Can one calculate with it? Remember, we said renormalizability depended upon the vanishing of the whole time mass. Well, now we've given the whole time mass, doesn't that upset it? Well, it's a very difficult subject. It was, however, solved and shown to be renormalizable by two Dutchmen, Boltman and Tuss. Tuss was his student. And they solved the problem. And for this enormous work, they received the Nobel Prize in 1999. OK, electroweak unification. We're trying to put weak interactions together with electromagnetic interactions. And Weinberg solved this problem uh, using our 1964 results, which are sort of embarrassment to us that we didn't do it ourselves, but Weinberg did it. And he found that he was able to unify QED and weak interactions. And there's not just one W, there's a W plus, a W minus, a C, and four scalar particles. Again, it has to be even number of those scalar particles. And again, Three of them go with the W plus, W minus, and Z to give them mass, leaving again an orphan or character. And here's the tutorial we're doing the same thing. We have the three H's absorbed by W plus, W minus, and Z, and leaving this guy here, the orphan. Which was basically discovered here. Okay. Okay, so 1979, Weinberg got the Nobel Prize, all over by Sean Salon, and a few years later, 1883, the W's and Z's were finally measured at these considerable energies, 80 GeV, 91 GeV, and again, I remind you that the photon mass is about 1 GeV. Okay, so, is this the end of the story? Well, let's see. The orbit is crucial to the whole structure, and we invested $10 million plus in order to build this LHC. And that doesn't even include the support of all the thousands of physicists who are laboring at this Atlas and CMS facility. <coughs> and on July 12th, as we already said, uh, July 4th, 2012, LHC presented the evidence for the discovery of this particle 125 GPB. Uh, the search goes on because they didn't pin it down as absolutely having spin zero. The evidence so far seems to point in that direction, but it's still not entirely verified. So, if it is the God particle, then Well, then the standard model will, at least for the time being, remain triumphant. And what is the standard model? We have here the quarks. And they know that, for example, a proton and a neutron are each composed of three quarks, say two up and one down, or one down, up and two down, and so forth. Uh, later discoveries in the realm of the quarks include the charm, strange, top, and bottom quarks. So we have three generations of quarks, lowest flying ones, higher in energy, still higher in energy. Here we have the leptons. Lepton is well familiar. Uh, it has a neutrino associated with it. 200 times as massive as the electron is the muon, and it has its own neutrino. And then there's a the tall meson, and again, it has its own, own uh, neutrino. And here we have the gauge boson, the spin one entities which mediate the interaction. We have gamma, the photon, which mediates the electromagnetic, the W and the Z, which mediate the weak interaction, and here we have, well, we didn't talk about it today, but there are the gluons, which mediate the strong interactions. And over here we have a particle unnamed as yet, which we'll call the H, and uh, different people have different names for it, but uh, I'll give you a possibility suggested by, well, not by my son, and he thought it might be by the white self. It's not the one the world has uh, generally adopted, but it, it works. It's amazing for this one. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, one explanation 
Foyish is that the mechanism is more complicated. Uh, each of the three papers, B, E, H, G, H, K, use essentially the same model to illustrate the broken symmetry mechanism. And that is perhaps a testimonial to the fact that when a physicist sits down and says, I want to look at the simplest possible way to consider a certain phenomenon, they all more or less think in the same direction. Uh, however, there are more complicated ways to do things, and uh, it could happen that we need to look at those. But I will uh, close here on the Einstein quote, which uh, is as follows, that uh, God may be subtle, but he is not malicious. So uh, uh, it could happen that perversely the simplest possible explanation does not work, but we'd like to hope that nature was not rigged in such a way just to make the lives of physicists more difficult. So we'll see. As uh, things get nailed down from uh, LAC and whether we see that this new discovery fits, that may be kind of the end, but uh, who knows? There's always a new beginning. So that's the end of my story. I think I thought I'd come back to the first one, but anyway, that's the end of the story. So I hope I communicate a little bit of play for what's going on in some <laughs>
every spin zero would have a spin one half partner, every spin one would have a three half partner, and so forth. So that's called supersymmetry. And uh, theorists thought this thing up because when they do calculations, there, as you saw from one of my earlier slides, there are these tremendous divergences which occur. And sometimes it's very difficult to get them to cancel up. But if you have integral spin and half integral spin, it turns out that their contributions are roughly equal and opposite. So you can get this cancellation to occur. So just to suit our calculational purposes, it's not necessarily the divine intention, but uh, there is can't resist the temptation to say this is a possible mechanism in which we can make the theory to seem slightly less magical. That would be okay. Yes? It's very difficult to find the How are they going to, for example, figure out what spin it has? Oh, yes. Well, okay. What happens is uh, the spin will determine the angular distribution. Okay, so if I have a uh, spin one particle that can pick out a certain direction in space. And so when you look at the decay products, you look whether there's a correlation between those decay products and this possible direction of spin. So that's going to be vastly different from a situation where the particle is spinless. It's not going to have any preferred direction for the decay process. Now, uh, that requires a lot more data because just to say that, yeah, there's a particle there, all you have to do is look for a peak in the uh, distribution curve, which I explained it. But angular distribution, that's a uh, far more difficult test. So it may well require the full 15 TeV and the upgraded LHC and just a ton of more data. So uh, a lot of temptation to jump to the conclusion that this is the particle which is being sought. Uh, Hoyer, who I pointed out in that uh, one slide, the Director General of CERN, he's uh, going around the world uh, making pronouncements that is the missing virus. Well, that's a privilege, but uh, it seems a little bit premature. So we'll see what happens in 2016. Yeah, please. Uh, I I've never 
written a paper with more than two other physicists. Now, that's not true of all theoretical physicists. Sometimes you have seven or eight dozen years. That's about as high as it goes. Call it you. Like anonymity, a uh, certain amount of anonymity, you can experiment. If you're free, EMF, please try to support 65. Thanks for coming.